Hello, and welcome to part two of the California Library Literacy Services Roles and Goals series, New Directions for Roles and Goals. My name is Valerie Reinke. For you old timers who know your literacy staff, you know that Roles and Goals has come a long way since its original appearance in 2003. What I'll do now is talk about why Roles and Goals is evolving yet again and how the feedback from you has been the impetus for these changes. If you're new to the Roles and Goals process, you'll gain some insight into why the form looks the way it does and why the process works the way it does. Roles and Goals did not fall out of the sky. We only wish it had. We can trace its mysterious origins back to the convocation of 1999 when literacy staff from around the state gathered at Stanford University's conference center in the deep dark woods of Lake Tahoe. The consensus there was that we, library literacy programs, needed a way to measure the impact of our services on adult learners, and we were not willing to use standardized tests. We really wanted to set ourselves apart from the California Department of Education in this regard. What we needed was our own method and our own tool to evaluate and to account for the very unique and customized services we were providing. A pretty tall order. But a couple of years later, in 2002, the State Library began hosting a series of focus groups to help what would become the roles and goals process take shape. Over the course of two years, these focus groups would involve over 50 different library literacy staff members from more than 30 different library systems. Along the way, adult learner leaders were periodically consulted as a reality check and to make sure that we were truly capturing the many reasons that they had sought out literacy help. Rhea Rubin, the state library's outcomes expert, was and still is consulted on creating the outcomes that would be drawn from the data. But rules and roles and goals really was still walking on its knuckles. The first version of the form introduced in 2003 was four pages long and in 12.5 listed over 99 possible goals. This was definitely a form that was trying to please everyone and as a result, what do you expect, no one was pleased. In 2004, the first data came in and libraries reported that thousands of goals were being met across the state. And I think for the first time, we had a sense that we were on the right track, but we knew the process had to be honed. So it was back to the drawing board. The form got a little shorter, the instructions got a little more clear, and the reporting got a little easier. In 2006, the State Library hired Amy Prevedel, who had formerly been a longtime literacy coordinator with the California Library Literacy Services. We hired her to take a hard look at roles and goals. She conducted interviews and administered an electronic survey to which 94 of you responded with passion. The recommendations that Amy has made based upon your feedback have become the backbone for this, the latest version of Roles and Goals. And finally today, the latest version of the form was field tested for a month in six libraries. The recommendations from these libraries gave final shape to the Roles and Goals form, which we will review in this video presentation. As you can see, Roles and Goals has come a long way and in the tradition of Darwin, we don't really expect the form and the process to stop evolving at this point. This continues to be a work in progress and one that's very much a collaboration between the State Library and literacy staff and learners from across California. Moving on from this very serious historical perspective, let's look at some of the basics, some of the fundamental things that you should know about roles and goals before we dig into the new form. First, all new adult learners, whether it be at an intake interview or soon thereafter, should be introduced to goal setting and the roles and goals process. This is where the adult learner may realize that California Library Literacy Services is not a traditional educational institution. Instead, it's the learner's goals that are central to everything we do. We train our tutors to teach to the learner's goals. We build a collection that supports learners' life skills needs. And we measure our own success by seeing whether learners are reaching the goals they initially set for themselves. Everything we do in library literacy services essentially revolves around the learner's goals. Number two, staff and tutors complete the roles and goals form in tandem with the adult learner. Under no circumstances would you give the form to a learner and ask him to fill it out on his own or without the complete support and attention of a literacy staff member or volunteer tutor. The roles and goals form is just a tool to talk about goals and so it's the conversation that is the key. Now conversation, last time I checked, requires at least two people. So establishing that rapport and helping the learner think about what she would like to achieve, both short term and long term, is at the heart of this process. I know you're short on time, I know you're short on staff, but our adult learners are the reason that we exist. We commit to spending time with them to find out their most deeply held motivations because that's the kind of literacy service we are. Hopefully adult learners will walk away from a goal setting session feeling like they've been heard and maybe the first time ever that they felt that way. 
Read the instructions. Instructions were not created to annoy you with their fine print and their know-it-all attitudes. They're there to make life easier for you if you'll just take the time in advance to prepare. And share the rules and goals and instructions with the adult learners you see fit. Um, make that process as transparent to the adult learner as possible without boring her to death. For instance, the roles and goals instructions give in-depth descriptions about what we mean by the four roles on the form, the lifelong learner role, the worker role, the family member role, the community member citizen role. Having some background on what those roles mean might help the learner envision himself in each of them and therefore help the brainstorm. Number four, roles and goals forms can be continually updated by the tutor-learner pair, formally update a minimum of every six months. Now, a tutor-learner pair can have that form with them throughout their tutoring sessions, and they can refer back to them as they see fit. E even on an every other day, they can refer back to them and update or cross things out as things become irrelevant. As the occasion arises, they should have that form right in front of them. Now, by formally updated, I mean that at a minimum of every six months, the roles and goals form should be updated by literacy staff. And the best thing to do is for staff to make an appointment to meet with the tutor-learner team and to sit down and just have a conversation about progress made on the learner's goals. I know it's not always possible, but it's something to strive for. Many programs are meeting with tutor-learner pairs and updating roles and goals every three months or every four months. As you're aware, staying in touch with that tutor-learner pair is critical to the success of your services. More often you can interact with that pair, the better it is for your adult learners, the better it is for your program. Finally, report roles and goals data to the State Library every six months. And you all know this. Uh, that includes your demographics and budget information. You're all familiar with this, so let's move right along. Your recommendations. Let's take a, take a look at the recommendations that came out of those 2006 surveys and interviews. Recommendation number one, create a short, simple, easy to read reporting form that students, tutors, and staff can easily use. Here's page one of the newly evolved roles and goals form. As before, the basic architecture of the form is the four life roles, lifelong learner, worker, family member, and community member citizen. Another new thing, you now have the option of printing this form in a two-page format with larger print and more room to write, or as a one-page version, which will probably make it even easier to navigate the form and will simplify photocopying and distribution. Whatever format you choose, um, this new version's shorter, it's simpler, and has that consistent formatting that you wanted. Now first is the lifelong learner role. Goals in this role include tangible things like learning the alphabet and getting a library card, but they could also include write-in goals, less tangible things like reading for pleasure or writing creatively. Writing creative, creatively, I can say that. In this role, help students think about how reading and writing can enhance their lives and help them grow as individuals. The worker role is for those who are employed or seeking employment, though it could also apply to a learner who volunteers or would like to be a volunteer. A learner's goals in the worker role could include everyday tasks like reading memos and writing email, but also far-reaching goals like learning new skills or pursuing a new career. Here's the back side of the form, page two, if you have a two-page form instead of the one, about the family member role. Keep in mind that the terms family and children in this case do not have to be immediate or even in the same household, so don't be tempted to skip over this role because your learner does not have children or is not living with or near their family. In the first place, someone who lives alone typically also has a network of people who act as family. In the second place, many of the goals here center on domestic concerns that are universal, like taking care of a home or apartment, budgeting, planning meals, managing family resources, those kind of things. Goals reported here could also encompass helping others, um, children or elderly parents, for instance, and building healthy relationships through better communication, something that might naturally occur as your learner improves his reading and writing skills and builds some self-confidence. Finally, the community member citizen role. This role is about the learner in relationship to his neighborhood or community, this country, his world. With stronger reading skills, learners will be able to interact with their surroundings like never before. They'll be able to vote, take advantage of community resources and services. They'll be able to advocate for themselves and others, for, advocate for the literacy program. Now notice the ever popular get a driver's license shows up here in this, these fixed goals, but also a new one, uh, get involved with communi a, a community issue. So just keep that in mind as you're brainstorming together. And let me just say a quick word about the back page of the form before moving on. 
In our field test of these new forms, staff and volunteers administering them passed up the back page 33% of the time. It could be that the roles on the back page, family member and community member citizen, are just less relevant to learners than lifelong learner and worker, the roles on page one. But somehow I think it's more of a question of training the people who use this form with learners to turn it over. Of course, with the single page version of the form, we shouldn't have that problem. With the two-page version, just be mindful that any training you do on the form should emphasize both sides of the, of the form and all four roles. Underneath each of the roles, there are three ways to account for learners' goals. The first kind of goals are the fixed goals, or you could call them predetermined goals or standard goals, like those under family member here, for example. Write checks, pay bills, or under community member, access community resources. If you recall the last version of roles and goals, the one you were using prior to this, had 59 of these fixed goals. Uh, but remember also, that's down from 99 on the original version, remember? This one has a total of 32. Hopefully that'll make it easier to locate the fixed goals, it'll help staff and volunteers become more comfortable and fluent in administering the form, and it'll mean fewer goals to report on. Always a good thing. Here's recommendation number two. Provide space for collecting other goals. In the interest of learner-centeredness, it made sense to bring back the option to write in other goals under each role. Let's face it, there are certain goals that just aren't going to be showing up in the fixed goals section. And my favorite example comes from the 2006 survey about what needed to change on the roles and goals form. And someone responded that a learner was able to file his own divorce papers, finally. The tutor wanted to be able to share that as a goal achieved. Now that tutor learner pair would be able to write that goal in into the part two other goals section. And don't you think filing divorce papers fits nicely in that fa family member role? Very tidy. Before using the other goals section, always make sure that the goal in question wouldn't fit into one of the more generic fixed goals. For instance, um, if your learner said write a letter, I want to write a letter to my Aunt Sue, that would not be an other goal. Instead, that would not be a write-in. Instead, you would add it under a lifelong learner role where there is a fixed goal entitled write a letter to blank with space to write in a name. Or if your learner says, I want to sign up for the WIC program, it seems very specific, but it could be captured in the community member citizen role under the goal titled access community services and resources. And you don't have to lose the details of the goal. Use the next, the notes section on page one to elaborate on a goal and to add details where necessary. There is a reason you would want to use these fixed goals as often as possible. These are the goals that are collected and tabulated by the state library, the ones that de demonstrate the difference that the CLLS is making. The individual other goals will not be collected by the state library, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now on to your next recommendation. Recommendation number three, ask for achievements that were made as a result of the student's participation in the library literacy program. Now what we've learned over time, and maybe this is self-evident, we've learned that as a learner progresses and improves her literacy skills, things happen that she could never have anticipated. Even with the best, most thorough goal setting, the learner will surprise herself and her tutor by unexpectedly reading or writing something that she hadn't been able to read or write before. And the place to capture these items is under part three, unanticipated achievements. Clearly, since they're unanticipated, there is no goal set for these accomplishments. These aren't premeditated. There was no game plan for achieving these goals. They just happened. In the field test, learners reported a wide range of unintended outcomes, including things like changes in attitude. Um, one learner reported that she had built her confidence. Another said he was more comfortable taking risks. And a third mentioned a feeling of success in a learning context. But there were other more tangible achievements, too. For instance, one learner said, after eight months on the job, um, or when the tutor reported after eight months on the job, Irma spoke to her supervisor about a raise and she got it. Another reported, Bill spoke to the audience at our annual literacy celebration, a first. Unanticipated achievements can take any form and this is the place where you're most likely gonna find anecdotes, which I think set next to the outcomes data will tell the whole story of the difference the CLLS makes in the lives of the people we serve. Okay, now that we've covered the fixed goals, the other goals, and the unanticipated achievements, let's move on to recommendation four, which was provide a sheet of paper separate from the report form where tutor-student pairs can brainstorm about goals. We are able to do that because it already exists. On the CLLS website at libraryliteracy.org, there are two examples of role maps, which is just the term we use to describe this separate piece of paper where staff and learner or tutor-learner team can brainstorm about goals. 
Those two examples are shown here. One on the left, really easy, just basically broken into quarters uh, for the different roles. And there's just plenty of room to freeform and to get your students' ideas on paper. The one on the right is a little more linear and, again, it's broken down into roles. Um, the nice thing is it prompts um, the learner to think about what skills they already possess and where they would like to improve. So it's kind of a nice approach um, validating what the learner already knows and brings to the tutoring session. You're welcome to use these forms or to create your own or just use a blank piece of paper. Do whatever works. Um, the idea of brainstorming goals apart from the roles and goals form is something we can't stress enough. There's nothing wrong with using the role map to document the goals and then later or use a blank sheet of paper to brainstorm the goals and then later fill those forms into the roles and goals form. Uh, let's face it, any form can inhibit communication, so don't let the form be a barrier. Be sure that listening to the learner is really your top priority. And finally, on to recommendation number five, field test changes made to the form and process, and pro what is that? Field test changes made to the form, oh, to the form and process, there we go, before introducing to everyone. Okay, and this is what you wished. You didn't want to be a whole state of guinea pigs. You just wanted a few libraries to be the guinea pigs. So we did select some guinea pigs. And here's your typical literacy guinea pig. Uh, we use six different library systems representing rural, urban, and suburban areas, large and small jurisdictions, city and county libraries. We tried to get the whole range of libraries, but six libraries participated in the field test. 17 literacy staff members and four volunteers administered the form to 89 learners in the period of one month. At the conclusion of the field test, the library sent in the 89 forms and then filled out an electronic survey to provide feedback and direction to the state library. Whew, it was a lot of work. Many thanks to these bold libraries. That's Calaveras County, Commerce, Hemet, San Diego Public, San Francisco, and Solano County. We all owe them a beer or a cup of coffee. Their choice. Now for the final part of this presentation, I'll share with you some guidelines and strategies for using the roles and goals form that were gleaned from the field test and the recommendations of those who participated. So we'll call it best practices for using roles and goals taken from the field test. Best practices number one, staff should be the ones administering the initial roles and goals form, if not all the rest, and we'll get onto that. Feedback from the field suggested that the initial form should always be done by a staff member. And typically that could be at the intake meeting or initial interview, whatever you call it. Some libraries have a volunteer who is specially designated to help with intake. And this would also work, but the person administering the first roles and goals form should be either staff or a volunteer who's dedicated to that particular task. And there's a few reasons for that. One, this gets the roles and goals process off to a good store, start. The form can be filled out completely and when a copy of it goes out to the tutor-student pair for update, if they are doing that without your help, they have a model that they can follow that's done accurately. Two, the roles and goals form helps staff understand a new student's motivations for seeking help from library literacy services. So after a conversation about goals with the learner as they come in, staff may realize that the learner could be better served elsewhere, maybe um, at the adult school or at the co community college. For instance, several of the forms from the field test came back blank, except for one writing goal, and that was past citizenship test. Unless your program is equipped to teach citizenship and your tutors have been specifically trained in this area, wouldn't this single focus learner be better served in a citizenship class, maybe at the local adult school? Something to think about. Third, the roles and goals form helps staff with the matching process. Again, once you've tapped into a learner's goals, you may find out that their fondest dream is to be a nurse or to be a policeman or whatever. Maybe so, now maybe your tutors, of your tutors, you have someone who's in the healthcare field or someone who's a retired police officer. Clearly, matching a tutor and learner together often boils down to convenience. You know, can they meet at the same days and times and all that? But the best matches happen when there's a link in interest as well. I think the rela relationship gets an extra boost, which might make the difference between retaining or losing your volunteer and your learner. So tapping into those roles and goals forms and following through on the match is another good reason that staff should be the ones administering. Best practice number two, ideally staff should be present at the follow-up as well. So as you're well aware, you periodically you'll be updating the roles and goals form and that's at a minimum of every six months. At this point, the volunteer tutor and the learner can update the form together, but ideally a staff person would meet with them to help them through the process and to provide support in terms of ideas, maybe even new materials and resources. 
Here are a couple comments from the field test libraries about how they conduct the follow-up meeting. First, I thank the tutor and student for the work <clears throat> that they are doing, and then ask assorted questions. What have you been working on since we last met? Have you made progress? Have you improved? How do you know? I also ask the tutor, what kind of progress have you observed? Another respondent says, I do a three-month and six-month progress review. Typically, the student doesn't even see the roles and goals form. It's completed immediately afterward by me or by other staff. I find the conversation easy to accomplish, and I'm able to get the information I need. Students like to see that I am genuinely interested in their needs, their goals, and their progress. Number three, best practice, you got to get the date for goal set. <laughs> and here's another good reason, by the way, for staff to do the roles and goals forms, getting that goal set date down. And the reason behind it is since the roles and goals process is based on outcomes or tracking the change that's happened to the learner over time, outcomes require a pretest and a post-test or a start point and an end point. And with roles and goals, that information is the date the goal was set and the date the goal was met. The field test showed that this piece of information often goes missing. In fact, of the goals that report were reported as met in the field test, 52% of them did not have a corresponding date for goals set. And this is what we noticed. Some libraries were scrupulous about getting all the dates just perfect. And other libraries missed it every time. And I think that what that suggests is it's just a training issue. If your staff and your volunteers are trained that they need both the goal set date and the goal met date, it's going to happen. Now, if a goal was met and the goal set information is not on the form and it'll happen, the tutor-learner pair can attempt to recall or estimate the approximate date that the goal was set. And if you're there um, going through and tallying the forms and you see some of the goal set information is not there, you can just make a call to the tutor or the learner and see if they can't recall that information. If the tutor-learner pair believe that the goal was never set, that the achievement just happened unintentionally, then this particular goal can be recorded in unanticipated achievements, where a date for goal set is not required. Okay, that's it for part two of the roles and goals series. Now, for more background on the roles and goals process, please refer to the instructions for the roles and goals process. That's the companion piece uh, to the roles and goals form, and it should be read by anyone who plans to administer the form. The instructions are archived on the State Library website, libraryliteracy.org. Also, take a look at the third and final part of this series, which is specifically addressed to literacy staff, and it's called Reporting to the State Library. It'll take you through the whole reporting process. This production today was made possible by Library Services and Technology Act funding from the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services, administered in California by the State Librarian. Thanks for tuning in.